Uh, well, I've worked as a lecturer at University of New South Wales in, um, in this area of sustainability with a view to um, uh, radical interpretations of um, our situation and uh, the alternatives we have to move to. Um, and I've developed this place uh, beginning, I think we started taking people through in the 80s as a, uh, an attempt to illustrate concretely some of the uh, sort of themes that uh, there is now a lot of theoretical literature on. But not, many, not very many places trying to demonstrate or illustrate. Yeah, that was, um, uh, of course, 1972 or three. the book was published. Um, that's 40 odd years ago. There's now a mountain of literature that um, it's overwhelmingly convincing that uh, not only are there savage limits to growth, but we've gone through many of them in the sense that it is now utterly impossible for all people to live at anything like the standard of uh, consum consumption or environmental impact that we have in rich countries. Um, and yet the mainstream uh, has virtually ignored that case. Um, certainly the you know, mainstream media, the politicians, the economics profession all bar a tiny minority and people in general um, proceed on the indubitable, never questioned assumption that not only are our present per capita resource use rates and ways like travel and jet aircraft and stuff, not only are they uh, secure and to be taken for granted, um, but there's no need to think uh, whatsoever about possibility that they aren't. Just limits issues are in effect not on the agenda. Um, the scene is a bit better than it used to be. Um, I think especially coming from the environmental side, people much more conscious than 20 years ago that uh, we really have serious environmental problems. Um, and that of course is one aspect of the limits. Thesis limits are not just resources but they're limits to environmental uh, capacity to put up with us and <laughs> buffer our waste and so on. Um, my view is that the awareness and concern will accelerate. It won't just be a uni-dimensional, unilateral, linear thing. It'll accelerate when it, when the problems really hit home. So that's a bit encouraging. But um, it's not just that there are limits to growth, but that they are so savage. That's one of the main points we're trying to get across, that um, the magnitude of the overshoot is enormous. And in general, uh, it, we think it makes sense to talk of a, a factor 10 overshoot. A number of indices that point to the need for us to try to reduce our resource use rates to something like a tenth of the per capita rate we have in rich countries. There are various factors you could look at that yield an even bigger number. If you take the iron ore consumption of rich countries to all the rest, multiples going up 80, 90 or something, um, so some things are m much worse than that general figure of 10. But if you do take it, it, it il indicates that we have to make an enormous effort if we're going to solve the problem. Um, our ultimate concern is to try and convince people that we can do that, but not within a consumer capitalist society or anything like it. We would have to change to what we call the simpler way um, and that of course involves a uh, happy acceptance of much, much less resource consumption, but it involves many other things too, like a very different kind of economy and a very different kind of settlement pattern. So we have highly self-sufficient local small-scale economies. Well, I think uh, on our website there's a fairly detailed uh, analysis of that uh, faith. It is a faith. Um, where to start? It's just totally implausible. For a start, the problems are far too big for any of the technical fix optimists that you read to explain how we could possibly get those uh, resource consumption rates down. The best known tech fix optimist is Amory Lovins. He talks about 
the possibility of reducing our resource use by a factor of four per unit of GDP. In other words, we could um, produce as much as we do, uh, have the living standards we have now on a quarter of the resource consumption, and he mutters sometimes about maybe that could be a tenth. Now, if you simply take the present overshoot, the present levels of resource consumption in rich countries, and feed in the notion of nine billion, not just one and a half, two billion, having those living standards, and feed in the notion of us, even the rich, trying to raise their living standards all the time, which is the supreme national taken for granted goal, then you end up with factor 30 type multiples that you'd have to achieve, and, and, and much higher than that according to some uh, sets of assumptions you can make. So a factor 4 reduction, you needn't even bother. If you thought that we could have 9 billion people living as Australians expect to by 2050 given our growth rates, then you have to be assuming resource provision rates that are in the order of 30, 50 times what they are now. So the tech fix thesis is usually just a mindless statement of faith which is not bothered to do any arithmetic. You get your pencil out and have a go at it and you realise that is just off the scale implausible. And they come up with ideas like, oh, we'll decouple, we'll, uh, we'll separate economic growth from resource use. Well, you can't. You can do it to some extent. You can reduce the amount of resources you need per unit of GDP. But if you look at the achievements and you look at the expectations, then you can't explain how we can have growing economy while the resource rates stay the same. Or, and of course, they're too big, they should be going down. And uh, the fact of the matter is that decoupling or dematerialisation is simply not happening. The economy at the moment, despite all those brilliant tech fix things like the computerisation of everything, the resource use rates are going up at a fearsome rate. So if technical advance, technical fix, is going to solve our problems, what I want to know is when's it going to start? Because right now those problems are getting worse at a horrendous rate, which indicates that we're going to hit the wall within a couple of decades or so, especially with respect to oil. Uh, many of the minerals, uh, the ore grades are falling. And then there's the social economic dimension to, and the most worrying problems are there, most obviously to do with the stupid global economy, the financial system we have. Now that can go down in hours, let alone, you know, decades. Um, the problems in that area, nobody understands exactly why those problems are happening, but it is very plausible that a major factor feeding into them is indeed resource scarcity. And, a number of people have argued that the, the GFC was, of course, due to a number of factors, speculative uh, lending and so on, but the trigger, the housing loans crash, um, which suddenly tipped the whole thing into trouble, um, many people have argued, look, that was basically due to suburbanisation, which is very heavily dependent on petroleum because we built suburbs that people had to have cars to get to and operate in to get to the shops and so on. And at some point, the cost of petrol to run those cars got to a level that the whole damn thing went down. Um, so you're dealing with an extremely fragile financial system. And it's very plausible to me that resource scarcity is already feeding into exacerbating that. Um, so many, many reasons for thinking that um, uh, social and um, biophysical and resource reasons for thinking that the problems are way off the scale of what technical advance could ever uh, make, make a difference to solve. Firstly on the economic side of it, um, we have an economic system that cannot but grow. It's, the fault there is not a matter of choice. Or, or, or indeed stupidity, there's plenty of stupidity around, but you're dealing with an economic system that's driven by um, forces, mechanisms in it 
uh, whereby it just must grow. The, the basic driver is a corporate drive for greater profits this year than last year. If they don't achieve that, they get sacked. So they can't muck around, they've got to look for increased opportunities to invest. So you have a system which has to get bigger over time, whether, whether anybody likes it or not. And as you rightly say, the parallel to that, the thing without which it couldn't work, is the obsession with consumerism and, get, and wealth and gain, getting richer all the time, um, which um, is now the culture. It is a culture of, in impolite terms, greed, or um, in politer terms, just ra the, the idea of raising living standards is about having more to spend, having more property, being able to travel more, and the obvious consumer things. So that, in my view, is our biggest problem. Uh, we have an ins irredeemable economy, but that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that uh, mindless, never questioned obsession with getting richer. And the way that's linked into so many aspects of our culture, like status and identity. You think if you're not uh, succeeding in the corporation, you feel bad about yourself, you feel guilty because you're not doing the right thing, getting ahead. So, uh, so many things um, are linked into the consuming rat race. And as I said, that's a cultural problem that has to be absolutely reversed. Um, and that's the source of our greatest uh, reasons for pessimism. That's just such a big problem. Um, the good news, we think, is that there are alternatives, that there is a, an alternative to the consumerist way, which is not just um, capable of sol saving the planet, um, but is indeed liberation to a much higher quality of life. Um, and it's at first sight not easy to get people to take that seriously. Um, and we go to considerable trouble in some of the stuff we write and spread around to try and detail the reasons why living more simply in new settlements is not just something you can do on your own in your own household with great uh, effectiveness but if you think in terms of living in new communities then the simpler way option we have no doubt can yield a far higher quality of life than we have now while cutting those resource use rates and saving the planet. Let me just illustrate very quickly one, one or two little things. How would you like to be able to build a house, pay your costs, and live very, very comfortably on working one day a week for money? Now, most people are trapped into a worried 30-year period of trying to pay off the mortgage, fearful that they'll lose their job and lose the house, um, and then, in addition, having to work uh, too long hours because stress, depression, anxiety are our biggest health problems now caused by the fiendish rat race everyone's trapped into having to work too hard to earn all that money to pay off the mortgage and so on. I know people who live in alternative communities who do in fact live very nicely in ways I envy on that one day a, work, a week working for money or two or something like that. Firstly, because they cut their expenditure by not having a big elaborate house, not having an elaborate wardler, having alternative sources of leisure whereby they don't have to go to Bali for a thrill every year. And secondly, and probably more importantly, living in a community that's highly supportive with all sorts of musicians and weekend concerts and stuff and sources of local inputs of food and shelter build your own little mud brick house with the help of the community. And, and so you're living in an economy that doesn't require much money, free food from the local fruit trees growing in the community. And that cuts down the amount of money you have to build, add in the fact that you build your house for a few thousand dollars because uh, it's built out of mud and your friends in the community help you build it. So we've got two things here. One is your, only, your own personal lifestyle choices to not live in an expensive way, but more importantly, living in a community that's highly self-sufficient and has a, a very big, elaborate, non-monetary economy. Like I go to Working Bees and I'm helping to maintain the community and I get free food from the, the neighbourhood uh, orchards. So put all that together and there's some illustration of the 
grounds for our case that it would not be difficult to design ways of life whereby we could indeed live in very, very frugal, low resource use rates, low monetary expenditure rates, with a GDP that's a tenth of what it is now, and yet have a nicer quality of life. Well, let me add uh, the fact that uh, all the indices are showing that as the GDP rises, it is not the case that your quality of life increases. Uh, quite a lot of evidence that it's just the reverse now. Like I said, the stress, depression, anxiety stuff could be our biggest illness, our biggest uh, health problem. Um, and, and so it is um, not just a myth, but it's a, a vicious lie that to, to plunge into cranking up the GDP is the best way of raising everybody's living standards. I would begin with the fact that capitalism is a growth system. It cannot but grow. Um, the, it, it's driven by the corporate necessity to make profits, to return. A uh, capitalist has borrowed money from investors and they don't want that money back and that is all they get back. They want it back plus a dividend. And if the managers of the bank or the capitalist firm don't deliver the dividend, they are out, they are dumped. It's a system which gives nobody any choice but to grow. Uh, it's also a system which cannot do anything but generate inequality. Because uh, when you come to think of it, the people who do well in a capitalist market economy are the people who've got money. People who've got no money cannot play in that market because uh, goods are sold to those who offer most to pay for them. If you're hungry and you've got no money, you starve, full stop, that's the end of it. So those with more money get first go at the resources and in global terms get all the resources. Most people are poor because they cannot bid in the resource market um, and they cannot uh, influence what's developed. What's developed is what promises the investor uh, the best return on investment and you never do that by investing in what poor, uh, what three billion poor third world people need. So it's a system which cannot do anything but magnify inequality in the world. And anybody who's read anything about the global economy knows that the rates of inequality are just skyrocketing off the chart now. Uh, the estimate last year that something like 1% are now own as much as everybody else, they have half the world's wealth. Now that is just in utterly disgusting and, and a tender keg. No, you can't expect that. And that's an accelerating curve that's got to that point. Where's it going to be in another few decades? Um, so they're just a couple of the beginning points in the argument that the system um, is just, just cannot be made to, uh, to work properly. The, um, the reformist uh, looks towards regulation. Now, if you did the regulating that would be needed to solve our problems, you would have regulated capitalism or out almost entirely or just to a small scale role on the fringe. Uh, for example, you would have to, uh, if we go back to my multiple of 10, the, the limits to growth argument is that you would have to cut down to a tenth, something like a tenth, the amount of producing and consuming going on. You cannot do that without deciding which 90% of firms you're going to phase out. Now let's assume my arithmetic's out a bit and it's not 90, but it's a big number. You're going to have to weed out firms and say, uh-uh, no sports car production. Uh-uh, no jetliners to take people on tourist trips to Bali. And you'd have to, you'd end up with a small amount of our present productive capacity, which does the things that need doing. And, and you would have to allocate that rationally to provide for everyone so that every little town and settlement had some sort of factory in it or near it that would enable it to do its exporting into the national economy to earn the money with which to import the things it can't produce for itself. We're talking about the most massive 
socialism, if you want to call it that, or regulation that has ever been imagined. You cannot go two steps in that direction without completely cutting and capitalism off at the, at the knees. Uh, there's, there's another line of argument that says it's just utterly impossible. Let me just mention a third one, another one. It's the mentality of capitalism, which is, uh, as Adam Smith and lots of people um, boast, the miracle of greed doing good for all. It's driven by self-interest and competition. And the conventional argument has been that, oh, well, that results in good for everyone anyway. Well, it patently isn't. It's now destroying the planet. But the motivation of self-interest, gain and greed is precisely what has to go. You can't design a good society which provides well for everyone on a very low per capita resource rate, which means it must be highly cooperative and, and within local, small-scale, highly self-sufficient participatory economies. You can't design such a simple, a simpler way system without assuming and making damn sure you've got a very high level of cooperation, participation, sharing, feeling for the welfare of the other, doing what's in the public interest. In other words, the value set has to be precisely the opposite of the one that drives this capitalist society. So I could go on, but there are a few reasons why it, it's just totally untenable to, to claim that you can tinker with reform or drastically reform capitalism to end up with something that's sustainable, morally acceptable and nice and still some form of capitalism. Yes, uh, the, the simpler way I see as being irrefutably, undeniably derived from the limits analysis. You must get people to think carefully about the predicament we're in. And I think that's um, an overwhelming case that leads to those limits conclusions. And that means we have no option but to go to some kind of simpler way. Now, the sort of detail that I think is plausible, may be wrong, some of that detail may be wrong, but the general pattern, um, it seems to me, is un undeniable. We can distinguish about four or five key elements. One, lifestyles must be less, far less materially um, expensive uh, resource use. Uh, and we can go on later to argue again that it doesn't mean hardship or deprivation, it just means doing things in different ways. Second major element is the notion of highly self-sufficient local small-scale economies, settlements, systems. Um, it's not that that's the only thing we have. Uh, we will also need wider systems, a national economy uh, that has steelworks in it somewhere and so on. But most of the output production distribution investment would have to take place at the small-scale local level whereby we have small communities running their own local economies. And I think in terms of uh, two to three thousand, four thousand people in a suburb or a town. Now, the simpler way vision can be manifest in tiny hamlets and big towns and indeed cities. But the most common, I think, level will be that town neighbourhood. So we think in terms of converting our existing neighbourhoods and country towns into highly self-sufficient local cooperative economies, which may still have some free enterprise, some market, some role for a market system. We can debate whether we want that and try things out, but it would have to be essentially a cooperative economy run by the village in participatory, planned, deliberate ways. So the town at its weekly meetings says, what, what are our most urgent problems? What should we work on? Do we have some un unemployed people still? Do we have some lonely people? How are the old people getting on? Do the kids have enough to do or are they bored? We as a town target our problems and get stuck into them. We work on them. We adopt them, embrace them, own them. We work out what are we going to do about this? Because we know that our welfare as individuals and as a town depends on how well this town functions. So if there's a problem that we ignore, we will suffer. We must make sure 
that this town works well, which means everybody's included. We look after the weakest, those with problems. We do the things that will maximise cohesion, uh, enjoyment. Um, we think about uh, when the Spanish anarchists did these sort of things uh, in the 30s, which was a mirac miraculous illustration of the power of this approach, I think. Uh, one of the things they did in very impoverished circumstances was decide to provide for hairdressing and for theatre tickets, keep the theatres going. Now, they were very uh, extravagant luxuries in the context of a very deprived situation, but they had the sense to realise we must make provision for the things that cheer people up and keep morale up. And so these are the sorts of decisions that people in the kibbutz and on communes, they run their own local economies in non-market ways and they provide for themselves, they provide for the problems, they solve their own problems in cooperative participatory ways and in ways that have got nothing to do with this economy and in ways that are not driven by gain, greed, but are driven by cooperation, concern for the welfare of the, the weakest and so on. No, it appeals to, enhances, builds on the strengths in human nature. The best things about humans are indeed the things you see in a family or a nice partnership. They are things like giving, concern for the welfare of the other, cooperating, nurturing, thinking about the public good. Uh, we humans do a lot of that. You, you walk around the city and I'll bet you see more people smiling and, and helping each other than you see being aggressive or punching each other. And now the human nature is evil thesis, very popular, um, but that's a thesis that suits the dominant ideology of competition and struggle um, and the best get to the top and we should um, grant them their privileges because they're superior. That whole syndrome of uh, caveman mentality, macho, competitive selfishness um, is a pathology that's highly characteristic of some societies, but not all. There are many societies that are not like that at all. It's very typical of Western society, unfortunately, and it's reinforced by, it's continually self-reinforced by raising kids to compete, to have to struggle for a job, to have to struggle at school to get good marks. So don't be surprised if after decades of growing up and living in a competitive, selfish society, you see lots of competitive, selfish people. It's very easy to change that, uh, get rid of it, by putting people in a context where they're not surrounded by that sort of behaviour, and B, they can enjoy the satisfaction that comes from helping, participating, participating and uh, nurturing others. Um, so we have institutions like the community working bees, which are great fun to be on. And you feel good because you're building, you're painting our windmill, you're building our mud brick premises for the new beekeeper. So uh, in the simpler way, one of its great merits, not easily appreciated at first, is that it has built into it self-reinforcing forces. It, it requires cooperation, but it rewards cooperation. So if we can just get these alternative ways up and running, you might be surprised how nicely we treat each other. Most nasty behaviour on the part of humans comes, uh, 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 happens because people are stressed and competing and struggling. Um, if you get people into a context where they're not harassed, stressed, competing, desperate, you might be very surprised how nicely they treat each other. Yes, it's, very, it's a very complicated issue. It's very unsettled. Um, I'm not dogmatic about the analyses that I uh, bumble towards, um, but they do indicate that um, renewables are problematic um, and there's a great deal of faith in the, the renewable energy um, at adopting the renewable energy thesis is, a, is an element within the tech fix position it, uh, many people especially many green parties and politicians uh, very readily say oh well, we can solve greenhouse problem and, and all our major problems we just change to these alternatives which are there already 
and and if we did that we'd have no greenhouse problem and we could um, produce lots of excuse me stuff for the third world etc um, the problems are two sort of problem areas one is power electricity um, which only provides about a fifth of our energy the most common and detailed and enthusiastic arguments you find are in the power area and my own view at the moment which is far from settled is that it may be it may well be that Australia a very privileged place in, for, in terms of renewable energy could get all its power from a wind sun hydro and biomass my pretty firm view is that would be very expensive maybe uh, very seriously economically disruptively expensive I, it's very unclear at this stage. A little while ago, I thought uh, it was more impossible than I do at the moment, but we we're a long way from knowing what the scene is. Um, you get problems like solar photovoltaic energy only works when the sun's out, and in winter, that's five hours on a good day, five or six hours. So you can't have much of your total supply coming from that, or you'd have to have oodles of solar panels collecting fiendishly for five hours while everything else didn't collect and you stored that energy. Now storing renewable energy is an enormous problem. There are only three ways it can realistically be done by the look of it. One's compressed air, that's not likely, that's very difficult at this stage and costly, not enough sites etc. The best option, second best option is uh, pumped water up into dams. Again highly problematic i'll give you a long paper detailing why the best option is biomass so you cut forests and stack the wood dry and burn it in boilers when you're when you've got a run of cloudy weather now in australia my guess is biomass is a good way of doing it um, what we don't know is how many cloudy bad windless days in winter you'll have to provide an average 23 gigawatts all the time to get through a, a bad period. We don't know and we don't know whether you can do it. We don't know if you can do it at what cost because these sources, wind, photovoltaics, solar thermal, biomass, often, sometimes none, almost none of them are working and often one or two will be working and the others aren't. So you have to have a lot of redundant plant a lot of plant that's sitting idle while something else is picking up the burden and that magnifies your capital costs greatly and some of my earlier analyses I thought that's just too big I now think in a privileged place like Australia maybe you'll pay a very high price but maybe you can do it the Europeans can't I have very little doubt Europe's a terrible problem because they will go two weeks in winter with no sun and no wind and freezing cold and if you think they're going to get their power from the Sahara, well, here's a whole other bunch of problems you've got to solve. And they do not have the biomass. They have a very densely populated place. They haven't got the land to grow lots of forests to do it that way. That's a whole, that's just an introduction to the problems in the electricity domain, which, as I said, is only one fifth of the total problem. And it's in the rest of the energy demand area that your big problems arise. What are you going to run transport on? Twice as much energy goes into transport as goes into electricity. And electricity is only 20% of our total demand. Um, I cannot see any way in which the Europeans can run their transport and all their other things on renewables, except in horrendously expensive ways. The best option being hydrogen, which you produce from your sun and your wind. And that's an extremely expensive path because it's extremely energy inefficient. If you have a windmill producing hydrogen to run your car on, then for every unit of energy that you use in your car, you need four units of energy coming from that windmill. And ditto for other, thing, uh, other uh, sources of use. I mean, as I said, transport is only, a, again, only a small fraction of your whole economy. Um, Australia has nothing like enough biomass. We're very privileged. We have something five times the amount of land than, than the world average produ to produce biomass. 
and we have nothing like. There's recently been a, um, a, an analysis of Australia's biomass potential, 96 million tonnes a year or something, take out the energy needed to produce biomass, um, take out the energy needed to, to build the generators, the biomass plant and stuff. You've got nothing like enough to fuel transport, let alone the rest. So I do not see how we in Australia can run everything on renewables. Um, when I look further, come back in, you know, some months time, I might see, yes, you can do it, but it would be very, very costly in terms of um, plant and capital. And uh, I know some people who say, no, you're not gonna, you mustn't use anything like the amount of biomass you're thinking about, even to top up electricity. Now, they're just a few of the lines of complexity and difficulty that many people who just, and many in the green agencies just naively uh, put out this tech fix faith, uh, fix faith that uh, you know, renewables can solve the problem. Let me tell you, after 10 years of headaches and pen and paper and trying to nut it out, it's a complicated field and, and you are not, it is not justifiable to just blurt out, oh, renewables will solve our problems. Let me just detail one more little complexity. Uh, energy is, I think, absolutely inevitably going to get more scarce and costly. And that's going to feed into everything in your economy. This handkerchief took energy to produce. Its cost will go up. And we don't know what the multiples are and how they'll work. And that will, for example, dramatically cut your resource estimates because the present quantity of resources you think you can get at is a function of the energy cost of getting those resources. That, in other words, those resources are gettable at the present energy cost of getting resources. If the energy cost goes up, you diminish the amount of minerals we can get. So um, the, the crucial above all energy problem is going to feed into and multiply worse than all your other problems. Well, a simpler way, philosophy is in no way hostile to high tech um, or modern technology. Um, we argue that if we went down an al the alternative as we see it, you would actually have more resources to put into R&D in high tech than we have now. Uh, for example, we spend a cool trillion dollars a year on arms on researching and building arms now. Well, we don't need them if we're not going to live in ways that oblige us to go and take each other's resources and fear and defend against others taking ours. Uh, and that is the world we have now. You need armies to protect your resource sources. Uh, think about, oh, so many other domains where we, we produce things that will fall apart in no time. We spend half a trillion dollars a year on advertising, which is trying to persuade us to buy things we otherwise wouldn't have bought. So if we made products to last, if we lived without wanting to buy all sorts of rubbish that we don't need, and if we had simpler sources of leisure and entertainment, etc., etc., uh, and agriculture is an area you could detail these arguments in at great length. The, her, our modern food supply system is just horrendously inefficient, using trucks to bring and ships to bring food halfway around the world when you can grow it all in your neighbourhood, for example. Now, if you put all those sources of um, silly waste aside and do things in sensible, easy ways, we would accumulate so much we could save that if we stopped producing this much and just converted that much of our present productive capacity to doing the things that high tech can advance on, we, you know, we'd have miraculously better medicine and windmill design in no time, greater effort and number of scientists going into those fields than we have now. So that's a long-winded way of saying simpler ways not in the least to be identified as opposed to high tech, modern technology, we'll have more of it. The sort of technologies we would have, you would, you would always start by asking, what is the simplest way we can do this? And we can do just about all the things that really matter, food production, house production, basic clothing and furniture making in craft ways, in simpler ways. 
it will make sense to have some factories, some mass production factories for nuts and bolts and basic steel and so on. But not only can we do things like make our own furniture to last a hundred years and be beautiful, but not only save the resources that are now being spent in your uh, shoddy production in uh, Taiwan shipped halfway around the world, but produce in ways that are enjoyed. Now, one of the biggest disasters in this society is it works terrible for a lot of people. And if we made those chairs and so on in craft ways in little factories all over the place, and if we made much more of our jam and fruit and honey through little firms working in neighbourhoods, enjoying running their own little enterprise and mm, designing their own labels and so on, we've converted work into, most of it anyway, shouldn't be much drudgery left, and if there was, we should share that. But most of the productive activity we need engaging in could be highly enjoyable. So you, you try and go for the intermediate and low technologies. Um, most peasant societies, traditional societies, have very viable ways of doing many, many things. They can benefit by higher tech ways. Um, but certainly there'll be some levels at which you say, it would make sense for the village to have a tractor which means we need to produce some rubber and some ethanol to run it and some foundries to make spare parts and so on. Um, if we had a sane world, we'd nut these things out as we go and we might decide, no, we're really overreaching a bit here. Let's cut back a bit on the high tech we have and let's see how much of the luxurious stuff we really can afford. It may be that we can afford one overseas trip a lifetime uh, which we may do in a windship, that's how I'd like to do my trip. And it may be that you do your university course on the way. So there are sensible ways of organising things, but it may, it may be that we have the resources to afford some high techy sorts of things. Maybe keep some airliners going, uh, maybe keep some satellites up to run computers. Now that's very problematic actually, because um, computers are very energy intensive and involve an awful lot of throwing away of resources. And I read the other day that there's more gold in a pile of mobile phones than there is in the ores they mine. So very great quantities of resources are now being thrown away. Um, but um, who knows what level we will find we can even out at. And it may be that we can engage in maintain more high tech than I currently think we can. But well, we think that out as we go, but my main point is we don't have to fret about this. We can provide very well by low tech ways. We can, hundreds of years ago, we knew how to build a beautiful house. That's one of the main things you need. We, we, we can do that almost without any metal. We can certainly do it without plastic. You can do it out of earth and wood, things like that. So that's, the, the tech theme is one where we can be quite optimistic about the simpler way, not involving, not involving any primitive deprivation or hardship. In a way, it's a bit annoying that we have to discuss and explain such things because there's so many people and groups out there who are now practicing following simpler ways and enjoying the benefits and it's annoying that uh, people in the mainstream don't know this. Um, there are now movements like downshifting, voluntary simplicity, uh, and so many people in the eco-village movement who for so long have, um, eco-village movements, good 30 years old now, have been living in simpler ways and enjoying the sort of benefits I've been talking about. I know people who live on one day's work a week for money, um, do their thing, uh, at a relaxed pace, they may be manic potters or crass people. Some of them are lazy, good on them. They can be lazy, they don't have to work much. They can sit around. Most of them are frantically busy um, in their own crafts and arts and in community activities. One of the things that tends to come on when you move in a simpler way direction is, to get, is getting involved in the communal. Um, helping on those working bees and good causes and so on, and enjoying that. Um, so it's it's just disappointing that um, that alternative way, I mean in the 60s with the hippie movement, to some extent 
uh, there was more consciousness of the possibility of a more relaxed way. Um, that's ancient history now, but um, there are people out there living simpler ways and enjoying the benefits. Let me try and, uh, yes, you're quite right, it's, it's very difficult to get people who do earn a lot of money and spend it on glitzy, thrilling, glamorous things like a sports car or a trip to Bali um, or all the electronic, electronic sources of uh, st stimulation and uh, spec spectacle, the key word in this um, postmodern diagnosis of a society full of fleeting thrills that uh, get your attention and you go gar for a, a minute or two and then it's gone and something else comes along and the consumer society provides you with more consumable experiences to throw away. Um, in that context, yes, it can be difficult to try and persuade someone that there are virtues in avoiding that and going for simpler ways. The One of the best is to go back again to the need to earn very little money. Uh, Thoreau long ago uh, realised and tried to persuade his friends, look, it, because I don't consume much, I don't have to work much, and I have all this time to think, to do what I want to do most, and that is right, get ideas down, and other people, of course, being artists and craftsmen. So there's a major, major benefit if you don't get trapped into working 20, 30, 40 years to pay the mortgage on your two big McMansions, boy oh boy have you gained a lot of time and freedom from worry to do other things. And in a sane world we would be able to build a very nice little house for I reckon $10,000 at most and you can do it for less than that if you like. And that's a perfectly adequate house. Now the, you've saved $400,000 there by the time you take in the Time, the payment of interest and loans to the bank and tax on the money. That's not negligible. There is a benefit for moving to simpler ways. Now there are many other more subtle things, um, one of which I think is to do with sensitivity. Um, the consumer way very easily debauches. It, it hooks you on spectacles on thrills, on big things. You're bored unless you can rent out a, a movie that's got four chainsaw murders and two train wrecks. And if it hasn't, you're bored. And you're constantly sucked down that path of requiring more and more expensive, thrilling experiences and products before you're satisfied. A consumer capitalist way is of course very much about the generation of dissatisfaction. A simpler way can escape that. You, you can get around that and be content with simpler things and find them more wholesome, more satisfying and more genuine. Um, there, was the, there was the most wealthy Australian who once walked into a casino and bet four million dollars at one sitting. Now if you've got to do that to be excited and thrilled and get enjoyment, you're actually quite ill. That's a pathology. There's something wrong with you. Um, I knew a little old lady when I was a kid who was very influential on me, not explicitly but by things like I just realised that she would stop going for a walk and be absolutely delighted at a flower and pick it up and with well, no acting or anything she just enjoyed simple things and somehow or other that stuck in my mind and I now realise that she is immensely rich she was so wealthy and just think of it if you have to buy a sports car to get a thrill and here's someone who can get a thrill from hoeing the garden or sitting in their backyard and watching the beautiful sunset, who can get that thrill by simpler things, then that person is very, very lucky, wealthy. Some people sit in monasteries doing Zen discipline for 30 years before they're able to get um, satisfaction from 
simple mind states of mind. Um, some people find it easier than others. Um, there are various aspects of this sort of thing which some people call mindfulness and of course a lot of meditation practices and courses that are uh, to some extent at least about trying to get into a state, a state of mind whereby you can appreciate the simple things and you don't need the expensive debauching things. Um, some of us find it hard, some of us find it easier. Um, it's an area in which some of my weaknesses are at their greatest. I find it very hard to sit still and appreciate as much as I should. I'm, I have some skill at those things and certainly my sources of satisfaction are all simple things. They're like hobbies and gardening and painting and looking at going for a bushwalk. Um, but nevertheless, I'm conscious of the fact that I could be so much more skilled at appreciating the good luck I have, the fact that my knees work and some people's don't. Um, there's so much to appreciate, be conscious of. Um, and that's a domain of learning and personal development is so important that we totally neglect in our so-called education system, which is really worker training, uh, technician training system. It has very little to do with education. So here's a focus of life development and skill development, personal growth, uh, which is infinitely big and we could explore and become better at for a uh, whole of our life, which is to do with simplicity, to do with seeking sources of satisfaction which are not tied to the consumer expensive way and which indeed I reckon anybody who goes down that path quickly realises yields much richer satisfaction. It's, you, you feel better if you can get satisfaction from doing something that's creating or helping somebody. I mean, doing good works for others is a great source of genuine satisfaction. There's something about the human whereby we do like to help others. Part, not because and when you help others you get helped, but that's not the main game. Helping others is a nice thing to do. So there are some of the, the, the well, I'm attempting to make more sense of the intrinsic benefits of living more simply, the personal growth dimensions that it can open up, which are not just about escaping the rat race, but finding fields which are genuinely much more rewarding anyway. I think we're going to continue to find it difficult to persuade people about any of this while the glitz is so distracting. But a very important part of the Simple Way vision is that our chances will open up greatly when the mainstream runs into more savage problems, which we think are not far away. When it increasingly fails to provide for people, when the petrol gets scarce and the prices go up and the supermarket shelves get more bare and the economy dumps more people into unemployment and poverty, then they'll start to think about alternative and simpler ways. And then they'll start to be glad that we've got alternative economies going in their neighbourhoods that they can come over to and get some basic foods and cooperation and support and so on. And then they'll start to think more seriously about the simpler sources of enrichment because the, the resource expensive ones are not there so much. So we see a, a tran our whole view of transition, which we haven't spoken much about, the very elaborate w discussion area that um, I think holds hope and the promise that the present difficulties we have getting people to take simpler things seriously, that scene will soon change considerably. Yeah, I think, sadly, I think most of the very considerable interest and effort in the world that's concerned with moving to a better system is mistaken and wasting its time. Most green effort, I think, is in that category. Most of it is um, reformist. It's working within consumer capital society to regulate it, tame it, um, make it all right, while it remains consumer capitalist, and I've illustrated some of the reasons why I think that's utterly mistaken. You can only solve the problems if you move to a very, very different 
overall economy and, and microeconomy at the village level, driven by very different mechanisms and driven by very different value systems. Um, we think there are two sorts of phases to the big transition. The first one is to encourage, get into, um, stimulate those transitions which are presently being attempted within voluntary simplicity, transition towns, eco-villages, most of which are indeed still highly reformist. But nevertheless, that's where we need to start and work hard for quite some time yet, maybe decades. Partly because those movements are indeed building many of the kinds of alternatives we need. They are building the localism, the cooperative networks, the community supported agriculture and so on. Um, and even though that many people there think, oh well that's all we need to do and we'll have tamed capitalism, and we think that's not true, they're nevertheless starting to build the sorts of institutions, practices, ideas, habits that we will need. What The second reason why I try and encourage people to get into that scene is because it puts us in the best position to introduce people working there to the wider, more radical perspective, which includes the fact that we're going to have to scrap capitalism and consumerism someday. We're going to have to face up to phasing out much of the present economy. We're going to have to face up to getting rid of the growth economy. So these are ideas which at the moment are anathema, hardly anyone even thinks about, let alone is ready to accept. We have to start introducing them and the best arena in which to do that subtle work, politely, not offensively, is down at the level of the community co-op and the community garden. So working down there is what I'm hoping activists who have the big picture and the radical, ultimately enormous radical change picture in mind, if they can take that down right now to the community garden level and start trying to get people down there to appreciate the bigger picture, then when the crunches in the mainstream start to get really serious and we have built up more localism, hopefully we'll have people with, the aware with a sufficient awareness to start moving on to those bigger radical changes and to start demanding them from central government and to start pushing central government aside, like a group of towns starting to set up its own cooperative collective farm to produce grain to supply those towns, because towns can't provide all their own grain and dairy products. So the need for the local system to provide for itself, hopefully in time, will help, will stimulate the move to the establishment of bigger systems cooperatively run by the town out there, which will be a stepping point to the day when towns start saying to central government, hey, you do this. You help us set up institutions like factories that allow, enable this town to earn some export income to be able to import the things that other towns have produced with their factories. You, the state, damn well do what we're telling you in terms of moving the national economy more towards one which provides for the local initiatives. So that this vision of hopefully moving slowly towards the radicalisation of the big systems, we can't make those big system transitions to a zero growth economy, to phasing out superfluous production, unless the consciousness at the mass level is very widespread, very strongly in favour of those hugely radical changes, which at the moment they're not. And I'm hoping I'm explaining the way in which we might move from where we're at through con consciousness raising to the point where we hopefully smoothly and peacefully get the enormous changes made in decades time, starting now down at the local level. So there's this notion of a stage one and a stage two, 
and different levels of goals. Uh, and at the moment, most people, most good green people in transition towns and so on, are starting down the path, but they do not have the big goals, many of which uh, many people would say is the most rampant version of socialism you've ever seen, so totally unthinkable. Sorry, you can call it what you like, but someday we have to do those big structural transition things if the whole limits analysis we're working on is valid. But uh, obviously it need not be a highly centralised state-run sort of economy. Indeed, what we're talking about is, is a, a world in which the power lies at the village level and anything that needs a bigger arrangement like the water catchment for a whole valley is organised through delegations from the village which is a classical anarchist notion of retaining all the power down at the grassroots level. The town assemblies do the voting. Everybody has a say and we don't have powerful states or powerful bureaucracies of the you know, big state Stalinist version. So one of the tasks we have is to head off the assumption that what we're talking about is that kind of world rule through big powerful states. Yes, there must be a lot of regulation and control by people, not the market, but we adamantly insist that that can be done without Big Brother. And it, what we're talking about, simpler way, will not work unless the power and the control remains down at the village level. The people in the village are the only ones who can possibly make that village work. They, that village cannot be made to work by some state-level authority ruling you. Oh, well, you have no choice but to work at, the, at the, this revolution, this particular kind of revolution, which in fact is unlike any other one that ever was on the agenda. It, uh, previous revolutions were about uh, moving towards greater affluence and wealth and so on. And um, that's it's conceivable that you might, it might make sense to do that through uh, taking state power and ruling from the top. You can't win this revolution that way. Uh, this revolution is about moving to power at the bottom. It's only by um, uh, an extreme version of participatory democracy that the new settlements, the new economies, the localism can work, can't work unless it's run from the bottom. So it's a very different kind of revolution, um, but it is a revolution and it's big as, as big as you've indicated. Sorry, you just got to face up to that. Uh, there's no choice but to work at it. There are reasons for pessimism because it's a big, big task and we're in a lot of bother and um, we are not very far down the path to the kind of consciousness that we need. But there are a lot of strong reasons for optimism. One is uh, that the vision of an alternative way is, I think, so attractive. It's what keeps me going. Um, and it's so easily done. We could do it in weeks if we wanted to. It's not like having to design a fusion reactor to solve the energy problem. Um, it's about simpler ways. Uh, it's about doing things to your neighbourhood with shovels and picks and you got a bulldozer if you've got one, but it's very easily done if you want to do it. It's about moving, it's not just about saving the planet through m miserable hardship and deprivation, it's about moving to ways that would liberate all of us. Um, you know, the, so many things are so depressing. Think about people in the third world who sit on the footpath all day trying to sell a couple of pairs of shoelaces and, and are hungry. We could change that in a matter of weeks. Now, the vision of, of an alternative that's terrific and, and easily done, I think should be, it's certainly my big cheer up. Another source of optimism is the fact that it is not going to be a slow transition. We are heading towards a rapid change as locomotives on a number of tracks head to the one point. Um, there's so many resource depletion, environmental problems, um, turmoil in the third world with 
discontent often feeds apparently into religious turmoil, but underneath that often there's deprivation, um, quality of life problems. Um, the most urgent resource problems are probably going to crunch heavily within two decades or less. The financially stupid economic system we have, uh, its financial base could go down at any time and all the things I re read say that we're in for a bigger, better GFC than the last one pretty soon. Now, that all means we're in for very big change soon, which will shake loose the, the inertia, the um, stolid stupidity, the myths, and it may all go pear-shaped. Of course it might end us all up in more trouble than we, we've got now, uh, and maybe irredeemable trouble, you know, we should have no illusions that this could be a termination of civilization, and many people think that's what's going to happen. But my main point is it will shake the inertia loose and we will get our chance because people are realising and will increasingly realise that the systems we have now will not provide. Something radically different will have to be done and that will at least help some of them, hopefully a lot, to see the sense of what we're on about and come on over. So that sets our task. We have, I think, not very long, a few decades at best, and maybe less, to get the alternatives up and running so they're visible, so that people who for a long time have said, oh, there's that quaint mob down the end of the road running their community garden, they're nice people, but um, they're a little bit misguided. People will start to say, oh, maybe they're onto something. Oh, maybe we should go down a bit more often because they've got fresh carrots and we haven't. So we have to get the alternative systems up and running. We have to talk interminably about them, spread the word uh, by example and by propaganda, by talking, by educational material. But the by far the most powerful educational tools will be the things we're building, not just the physical gardens and the mud brick dog sheds and little community centres and stuff, but our institutions, our ways, our sharing, our co-ops, our community supported agriculture and so on. So there's your task in the short run, um, but there's two tasks. One is, if you want to save the planet, go down to the community gardens and get stuck into the things happening there, but go with in mind the fact that we must eventually face up to those gigantic at present, at present highly unpalatable structural changes, getting rid of growth, stopping the market from dominating. Take those ideas with you and work at getting people to understand that. Work slowly and politely, uh, but eventually unless we get those messages across too, we're not going to make the big changes. never questioned assumption that not only are our present per capita resource use rates and ways like travel and jet aircraft and stuff, not only are they uh, secure and to be taken for granted, um, but there's no need to think uh, whatsoever about possibility that they aren't. Just limits issues are in effect not on the agenda. Um, the scene is a bit better than it used to be. Um, I think especially coming from the environmental side, people much more conscious than 20 years ago that uh, we really have serious environmental problems. Um, and that of course is one aspect of the limits. Thesis limits are not just resources but they're limits to environmental uh, capacity to put up with us and <laughs> buffer our waste and so on. Um, my view is that the Awareness and concern will accelerate. It won't just be a uni-dimensional, unilateral, linear thing. It'll accelerate when it, when the problems really hit home. So that's a bit encouraging. But um, it's not just that there are limits to growth, but that they are so savage. That's one of the main points we're trying to get across. That um, the magnitude of the overshoot is enormous, and in general, uh, it 
we think it makes sense to talk of a, a factor 10 overshoot. There are a number of indices that point to the need for us to try to reduce our resource use rates to something like a tenth of the per capita rate we have in rich countries. There are various factors you could look at that yield an even bigger number. If you take the iron ore, can't explain how we can have growing economy while the resource rates stay the same. Or, and of course, they're too big, they should be going down. And uh, the fact of the matter is that decoupling or dematerialisation is simply not happening. The economy at the moment, despite all those brilliant tech fix things like the computerisation of everything, the resource use rates are going up at a fearsome rate. So if technical advance, technical fix is going to solve our problems, what I want to know is when's it going to start? Because right now those problems are getting worse at a horrendous rate, which indicates that we're going to hit the wall within a couple of decades or so, especially with respect to oil. Uh, many of the minerals, uh, the ore grades are falling. And then there's the social economic dimension to, and the most worrying problems are there, most obviously to do with the stupid global economy, the financial system we have. Now that can go down in hours, let alone, you know, decades. Um, the problems in that area, nobody understands exactly why those problems are happening, but it is very plausible that a major factor feeding into them is indeed resource scarcity. And a number of people have argued that the, the GFC was, of course, due to a number of factors, speculative uh, lending and so on, but the trigger, the housing loans crash, um, which suddenly tipped the whole thing into trouble, um, many people have argued, look, that was basically due to suburban resource consumption, and he mutters sometimes about maybe that could be a tenth. Now, if you simply take the present overshoot, the present levels of resource consumption in rich country, and feed in the notion of nine billion, not just one and a half, two billion, having those living standards, and feed in the notion of us, even the rich, trying to raise their living standards all the time, which is the supreme national taken for granted goal, then you end up with factor 30 type multiples that you'd have to achieve, and, and, and much higher than that, according to some uh, sets of assumptions you can make. So a factor four reduction, you needn't even bother. If you thought that we could have nine billion people living as Australians expect to by 2050, given our growth rates, then you have to be assuming resource provision rates that are in the order of 30, 50 times what they are now. So the tech fix thesis is usually just a mindless statement of faith, which is not bothered to do any arithmetic. You get your pencil out and have a go at it and you realise that is just off the scale implausible. And they come up with ideas like, oh, we'll decouple, we'll, uh, we'll separate economic growth from resource use. Well, you can't. You can do it to some extent. You can reduce the amount of resources you need per unit of GDP. But if you look at the achievements and you look at the expectations, then you can't consumption of rich countries to all the rest, multiples going up 80, 90 or something, um, so some things are m much worse than that general figure of 10. But if you do take it, it, it indicates that we have to make an enormous effort if we're going to solve the problem. Um, our ultimate concern is to try and convince people that we can do that, but not within a consumer capitalist society or anything like it. We would have to change to what we call the simpler way um, and that, of course, involves a uh, happy acceptance of much, much less resource consumption, but it involves many other things too, like a very different kind of economy and a very different kind of settlement pattern. So we have highly self-sufficient local small-scale economies. Well, I think uh, on our website there's a 
fairly detailed uh, analysis of that uh, faith. It is a faith. Um, where to start? It's just totally implausible. For a start, the problems are far too big for any of the technical fix optimists that you read to explain how we could possibly get those uh, resource consumption rates down. The best known tech fix optimist is Amory Lovins. He talks about the possibility of reducing our resource use by a factor of four per unit of GDP. In other words, we could um, produce as much as we do, uh, have the living standards we have now on a quarter of the I uh, well, worked as a lecturer at University of New South Wales in, um, in this area of sustainability with a view to um, uh, radical interpretations of um, our situation and uh, the alternatives we have to move to. Um, and I've developed this place uh, beginning, I think we started taking people through in the 80s as a, uh, an attempt to illustrate concretely some of the uh, sort of themes that uh, there is now a lot of theoretical literature on. Not very, not very many places trying to demonstrate or illustrate. Yeah, that was, um, uh, of course, 1972 or three. the book was published. Um, that's 40 odd years ago. There's now a mountain of literature that um, it's overwhelmingly convincing that uh, not only are there savage limits to growth, but we've gone through many of them in the sense that it is now utterly impossible for all people to live at anything like the standard of uh, consum consumption or environmental impact that we have in rich countries. Um, and yet the mainstream uh, has virtually ignored that case. Um, certainly the you know, mainstream media, the politicians, the economics profession, all by a tiny minority, and people in general, um, proceed on the indubitable 